I wanted to thank you all for, um, for sticking with this. We're getting great questions, and, um, and this, is, this is just a, a wonderful meeting so far. But it's time for our last speaker. Um, and the exciting topic of restoring movement and communication using brain-computer interfaces. Um, Dr. Sergei Stavitsky is an assistant professor of neurological surgery, and he's co-director of the UC Davis Neuroprosthetics Lab. He's a neuroscientist and a neural engineer who works at the, at the intersection of systems, computational neuroscience, neural engineering, and machine learning. His research focuses on understanding how the brain produces movements and applying this knowledge to build brain-computer interfaces to restore uh, lost speech and movement for people with paralysis um, that, for instance, might have come from spinal cord injury, from stroke, or from ALS. For 2022, Dr. Stavitsky made a New Year's resolution to learn how to cross-country ski and to take advantage of his newfound proximity to Tahoe. And recently, he joined the estimated 14% of Americans who acquired a new pet during the pandemic. So meet Feta, and join me in welcoming Dr. Stavitsky. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to have recently joined this UC Davis uh, neuroscience community. And I really appreciate this opportunity to tell you about brain-computer interfaces and how we're using this new technology to restore patients' lost movement and communication. I think many of you in the audience may recognize Christopher Reeve. He was an actor famous for his role as the original Superman. Tragically, he was paralyzed after breaking his neck in a horseback riding accident and became an activist for improving the lives of people with disabilities. Like most people with very severe spinal cord injuries, Chris Christopher Reeve remained paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of his life. The late physicist Stephen Hawking provides another poignant example of how conditions like ALS rob individuals not only of their ability to move, but also to speak. And there are a lot of such individuals, about 15,000 in the US with ALS, and hundreds of thousands with tetraplegia, where stroke and spinal cord injury are the leading causes. What's notable about both Christopher Reeve and Stephen Hawking is that despite their well, immense uh, fame and resources, there was almost nothing medicine could do to help them. And that's the really frightening reality today. Despite all of our medical advances, uh, if the connections between your brain and the muscles are damaged, we still cannot heal that. However, thanks to modern neuroscience and engineering, we're starting to be able to offer at least some means to regain the ability to move and communicate. So this woman, uh, she lives in the Bay Area and has ALS. She can't talk, she can't move, but she's part of the BrainGate clinical trial of a brain-computer interface, or BCI. And in the video I'll play, she's going to try to move her hand as if controlling a computer mouse. She has hundreds of electrodes in her brain, and together with computers and algorithms, these form this BCI, which allows us to figure out the movements she's trying to make based on her neural signals. She uses this BCI to control the computer cursor and type on screen. I'm just gonna turn up the volume a bit. So a BCI can also restore the ability to reach and grasp. In this video from my postdoc work, this gentleman who had a spinal cord injury about a decade before he enrolled in our study is attempting to move his arm and hand. He's got about 200 electrodes in his motor cortex. Note that there are two of these little boxes on top of his head. And as you can see, we can do a pretty good job of figuring out what he wants to move and when he wants to move. And so let's unpack how this works. The problem we're trying to solve is that the brain signals can no longer reach the muscles. And so our strategy is to basically bypass the injury and go to the source of the movement command, a part of the brain called the motor cortex. Once we have these neural signals, we, we apply computer algorithms to identify or decode what they mean. And from there, we reconnect these movement commands to an action. For instance, moving a computer cursor, a robot arm, or even synthesizing speech. And in some cases, we'll even complete this loop and electrically uh, write information back into the brain, as I'll show you later. 
So a key step in this BCI is actually measuring brain activity. Here I'm showing you the type of sensor used in these earlier videos. Each of these so-called Utah electrode arrays consists of 100 tiny wires, and these wires are placed inside the brain where they can listen to the activity of one or a handful of neurons, and although we're only able to measure a tiny fraction of the you know, millions to billions of brain cells involved in controlling movements, this still gives us a great deal of information about what the person wants to do, if we can understand what this brain activity means. So how did we as a field build up enough information to make such BCIs possible? Well, in keeping with today's theme of 30 years, I wanna show how far we've come before turning to what's uh, hopefully to come in the future. So by the end of the 80s, we had a rough understanding of how to interpret brain activity in the motor cortex thanks to work in animal models. And so a lot of the foundational studies look something like this. A monkey would be trained to move this handle to one of eight targets. And while he was doing this, scientists would use a single electrode at that time to measure the firing activity of one neuron. So here's an example of the data. Each of these little tick marks is when this neuron fired. And these data are grouped by which target along that circle the animal is reaching towards. And so what researchers observed was that the neuron would fire a lot more for certain directions, in this case leftward reaches, and a lot less for reaches in the opposite direction. And so we'd say that this neuron has a leftward preferred, preferred direction. So 30 years ago, scientists realized that by looking at the activity of a bunch of different neurons, each with their own preferred directions, we could basically add up how strongly each of them was voting in favor of its preferred direction and thus figure out collectively which way the monkey was about to reach. And this knowledge formed the basis of the first decoder. So imagine now we have a person with paralysis and we're trying to build a BCI. Let's say we've put an electrode array in their brain and we can measure this example neuron. We would first have the robot arm make automated movements left and right and then ask the person to try to make the same movement. And I'll now play this animation and you'll hear the activity of a neuron. So that neuron became very active when the participant was trying to move their arm to the right. And this training process lets us calibrate our decoder. So now, if we close the loop and have that robot arm controlled by the BCI user's brain activity, whenever this neuron fires more, it would uh, you know, nudge the arm to move more to the right. And so this approach was finally put into action 18 years ago with the first human trial using multi-electrode arrays. So here we see a man named Matt Nagel, who's the very first participant, controlling a computer cursor. Excellent. So what's next? Next, I'd like to draw a circle. You're gonna draw a circle? And as you can see, back then the performance was not amazing, right? This cursor kind of wanders around, the circle is not very round. Um, but in the past decade, thanks to more sophisticated decoder algorithms and a better understanding of the nuances of motor cortex, performance improved. So by 2015, it had doubled, and it doubled again in 2017. And so for comparison, on the left, I'm now showing the very fast and precise cursor control demonstrated five years ago. by the Stanford lab where I did my postdoctoral training. And so if this were used to select letters on a keyboard, this allowed the participants to type at a rate of eight words per minute. And it gets even better. So just last year, the same group doubled performance yet again, this time by decoding attempted handwriting rather than point and click selection of letters. So in this video, you can see letters appearing on the screen as this participant imagines writing them with a pen even though he can't, of course, move his hand. So I just wanna take a minute to emphasize how essential animal research was to making this technology safe and effective for people. The reason I could enable people with paralysis to move robot arms is because we learned so much about how the brain controls arm movements and hand movements from monkeys, which have a similar anatomy. And so here you can see an early study in which a monkey who's not paralyzed is controlling a robot arm to feed himself. 
Only 10 years ago, these discoveries were translated to people. So I work with clinical trial participants, not monkeys, but there's basically no way that labs like mine would be able to build BCIs for patients if there were no animal studies to prove, first of all, that the devices we're implanting are safe, and also to build this foundation of fundamental neuroscience that informs how we decode brain activity. So what kind of BCI advances do we have to look forward to in the next 30 years? Well, one frontier is to reactivate paralyzed limbs. So instead of using decoded movement commands to move a prosthetic arm, neuroengineers are trying to apply electrical stimulation to move the person's own paralyzed muscles. To about 20 years ago, a group showed this was possible. So in this first demonstration, uh, the person's arm muscles were reactivated with wires, but this wasn't done using brain activities. Uh, the patient had to press a button on the little external control unit to select different patterns of movement. And about 10 years ago, a group performed another monkey study where they temporarily paralyzed the hand muscles with lidocaine. And they then demonstrated that they could decode the intent to grasp from the brain using Utah rays and use that to drive the hand muscles. And so finally, five years ago, a full muscle stimulation BCI was achieved in a person. This man here is moving his arm with just motor cortex decoding plus wires that stimulate his muscles. Now, as you can see, it's really slow. It's far from able-bodied, but he is feeding himself for the first time in years. And by the way, uh, this contraption over his arm, it's not like a motorized exoskeleton. Rather, it passively holds his arm up because the strength provided by this early muscle simulator was not sufficient to fully counteract gravity. So in the coming years, we'll see new and better muscle stimulators, and that will allow patients like this gentleman to move much more quickly and to get rid of those wires that go through the skin, basically make everything fully implanted. A similar approach is also being used uh, to restore walking. So just this year, a group in Switzerland showed that they could implant stimulating electrodes on the outside of the damaged spinal cord. And so when the right commands are entered on this tablet, the stimulator allows this man to stand and to even to take steps. What I think is really amazing about that work is that this group went from a first demonstration in rats 10 years ago to monkeys only four years later and started in people just five years ago. And so it seems really likely that in the coming years, if not year, they'll be able to command the walking just using the person's brain activity instead of relying on that external controller. A second BCI frontier is to restore, restore the sense of touch in people who are paralyzed. So the idea is that we can put sensors on a prosthetic limb and transmit information about the limb into the brain by applying precise electrical currents in the corresponding brain areas. So in what should now be a very familiar pattern, uh, foundational work was done a decade ago in monkeys. This read and write BCI showed that animals could tell apart different patterns of sensory cortex stimulation. And five years ago, this was translated to clinical trial participants in the same set of groups at University of Pittsburgh. So in this video, when the researcher presses on one of the robot's fingers, the corresponding electrodes in this person's sensory cortex are stimulated. Index. Ring. Pinky. Index. And just last year, it was shown that this actually improves the BCI user's ability to pick up objects, right? So they get faster and better at it. So the next step for the field in this domain is to restore not just a sense of touch, but also proprioception, which is our sense of where our body is in space. And proprioception is absolutely essential for making fast, fluid movements. Now, the challenge with this is that proprioceptive brain areas are buried deeper in the brain, and so it's much harder to reach them with electrodes, and we still don't have nearly as good an idea of how this sensation is actually encoded. But people will study this, and it will get done. And so the third new frontier, and one that I'm particularly excited about, is BCIs that restore the ability to speak. The point-and-click handwriting BCI I previously showed uh, are remarkable, and they already go a long way to allowing people to freely communicate, even if they're unable to move or speak. 
But even that ultra-fast handwriting VCI is about eight times slower than the speed at which I'm speaking with you today. So my lab here at UC Davis is working on a speech BCI that would decode the neural signals as a person tries to talk. Now, this is a much harder problem because we don't have an animal model for speech. You know, there's no monkeys that talk. And so we know a lot less about the brain regions that are involved. But one way that neuroscientists have been able to get started on this journey is by taking advantage of human brain recordings that already happen for other medical purposes. So for example, people with intractable epilepsy often undergo a week or two of brain recordings in the hospital to help neurologists diagnose exactly where those seizures are originating. And these electrocorticography grids are placed on the surface of the brain and allow scientists to measure neural activity as the patients talk. So a few years ago, a group at UCSF showed that they could use machine learning to reconstruct what the person said from their ECOG measurements. So I'm showing you a spectrogram of the person's actual voice as they spoke out loud those two sentences. And here's what the researchers predicted was spoken from the brain activity. Now it's far from perfect, it's not quite intelligible, but it does capture a lot of the broad speech features. So that was in a person who could still speak but just had epilepsy. Last year, that same group showed that in a person who has been unable to speak for 16 years due to a stroke, these speech brain areas also contained information about what the person was trying to say. So in this video, the researchers are asking the participant a question at the top, and they're decoding what words he's trying to say in reply. Now, this BCI is, is quite slow, and it was limited to only outputting one of 50 words, but this is still really, really exciting because it meant that the speech information is still accessible from the brain. We now just need to read it out faster and more accurately. And so my group is building on this work to develop a speech BCI that records from inside the brain rather than from just outside the surface. We're doing this because we expect that this will give us a much clearer picture about what the person's trying to say. So by analogy, uh, if someone were standing outside this lecture hall, they could probably sort of hear what's going on. Maybe they can hear if I'm speaking or if people are clapping. But if you put a microphone right inside the room, you'll obviously be able to understand and hear the conversation much better. And so I got started on this a few years ago during my postdoc when I was still building BCIs to move robot arms. So as part of that, we already had these clinical trial participants who had Utah rays, but they were in the hand area of the motor cortex. This is an area that's not to believed to contain information, information about speech. But I thought, hey, you know, these textbook maps of the brain were drawn using much cruder measurements than what we have available today. And so let's just give it a try. And our participants, who are wonderful, um, you know, they're paralyzed, but they can still speak. And so they were very happy to just speak while I recorded their brain activity from this little patch of cortex. And so here's what I found. I'm showing you the activity of one neuron. Again, each tick is an action potential or a firing of that neuron, while the person spoke different syllables, which are shown in the different colors. And if we average this data, we see that this neuron is not only active, but it's distinctly so for different syllables. And other neurons, like this one, showed a different pattern of speech-related activity. So this is really cool, not only because it showed just how little we actually know about the human brain, but also because it meant that I could prototype ways to decode this activity towards building a speech BCI. And so here's an example of what we could do. I'm going to play an audio recording, uh, and first you'll hear what the person actually said, and then you'll hear the same word synthesized from just his neural activity. Veil. Veil. Garage. Garage. Tam. Tam. Shove. Shove. Now, these are some of the best examples, and this is not good enough to allow a person to talk again intelligibly. But remember, I did this using measurements from basically the wrong part of the brain. And so our, what our lab is now gearing up to do, hopefully later this year, is to recruit clinical trial participants who cannot speak and to place Utah rays in what we think is the optimal part of the brain, the speech motor cortex. And I'm doing this together with my lab co-director and UC Davis health neurosurgeon, Dr. David Bramman, who is here today, so raise your hand. Hey, David, thank you. 
And we're part of a four institution collaboration, which allows us to actually do this not just in one or two participants, but hopefully in more, faster. And as far as I know, we are the only team that is trying this approach. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. And so just the last topic I wanna to touch upon is the neural interface hardware, those devices that go inside the brain and what's available to help BCIs, uh, to develop BCIs to help people. So most of the work I showed you today uses this Utah Ray. And that is today the best available interface that's approved for human use. But it's actually pretty old technology. I mean, it's not quite 30 years, but getting there. Whereas, for just one example, today in research labs that study animal brains, uh, many researchers are using a probe called the NeuroPixels. It was developed by a consortium of nonprofits and foundations only five years ago. And each of these little needles is not only smaller than one Utah array electrode, but it can also record from 384 distinct locations instead of just one. And these devices, which are made using modern semiconductor industry methods, are scaling up like, you're, like you'd expect from silicon technology, right? Your, your iPhone doubles in speed every year. And you know, similarly, in just the last four years, they've increased the number of neurons these probes can record to around 5,000 per probe. And so now several groups, including ours, are working towards adapting these devices for use in humans. And so while we're starting our speech BCI effort using the neural interface hardware that's already available, it could well be that in about five years, our BCI will look more like this. With more than 1,000 electrodes, fully wireless, and with a decoder running on a small device like a tablet. I am really looking forward to this, because at that point, I believe we'll have access to enough brain cells to restore really high quality speech and the form factor of the device is such that the patient could use it 24 seven at home or out and about. And so that's the medium term goal of our lab. We wanna make it so that if someone is diagnosed with ALS or has a stroke and loses their ability to speak, we could actually tell them, yes, we have a therapy for you. We can place this device in your brain, we can pair it with a small computer, and now you can talk to your loved ones, you can call your physician, you can use a computer, you can write emails, almost as fast as you could before your injury. I think this would have a huge impact on the lives of these patients, their families, and the wider community. And it would also demonstrate to society how fundamental systems neuroscience, understanding how groups of neurons generate a behavior, like speech, can be translated into crucially needed therapies. And just lastly, zooming out in the next 30 years, I predict that brain-computer interfaces are gonna be used to treat not just paralysis, but also a wide range of neurological and psychiatric conditions, including memory loss, for example, from Alzheimer's disease, and currently untreatable depression. So this will be yet another tool in our arsenal in addition to those incredibly exciting methods that Drs. Kim and McAllister just talked about. So I think BCIs can make a difference in these other domains by precisely reading from and then fine-tuning the relevant neural circuits. And while I didn't have a chance to tell you about this today, there are many groups that are already working on this. All of those efforts will benefit from the much more advanced algorithms and neural interface hardware that are being developed and initially tested in studies like ours that are aimed at restoring speech and movement. And so it's a very exciting time to be in neuroscience and neuroengineering. So this work is only possible uh, thanks to a large team of really smart and hardworking people who I want to acknowledge. They include our new lab, shown here as Zoom Boxes, and my collaborators at Stanford and the other BrainGate sites. And then uh, finally, a big thanks to my current and recent funding sources, and most importantly, these clinical trial participants. And these are you know, truly incredible people who, despite everything they're dealing with, uh, selflessly give their time to help us make discoveries and develop new technologies that will help in the future people that are in a similar situation to their own. So lastly, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take your questions. That was really awesome, thank you. Um, I just had a question on implanting these devices. Is there any um, negative effects of putting these things into, inside of someone's brain? 
Great question. We should probably direct it to the neurosurgeon, but I'll give you the short version answer, which is, um, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, is there any risk or potential downside of implanting someone in someone, a device in someone's brain? And so, yeah, you know, I want to emphasize it's not zero risk. Um, part, you know, the primary end goal of our clinical trial, because it's a very early stage, basically the equivalent of phase one, is to establish safety. Now, to date, we've had a very good safety record, and that will soon be published with, I think now, 15 participants over 15 years. Um, but it's it is a brain surgery, so there is always some risk. And so, you know, really it's about balancing risks and trade-offs. Um, you know, if you're perfectly healthy and just want to like control your smartphone with your brain, I would not recommend an implanted BCI. Uh, but also at the same time, there are a lot of groups working on non-invasive systems where they may not have that same accuracy. I don't think we'd be able to restore movement or speech with a non-invasive device, but we can probably use it for other like, diagnostics or sort of uh, low bandwidth communication. It's a great question. Great presentation, uh, Dr. Stavisky. Um, I'm really curious where you place the module. I would assume at different parts of the brain you're using for the motor function versus the verbal function or writing function. How, how do you decide where that goes? Yes, yeah, so the question is how do we know where to put the electrodes? And so, you know, we, I kind of said we're surprised by how much we don't know about the brain, but we do know a lot about human neuroanatomy. So from tools like fMRI, from microstimulation during surgeries, from lesion studies, we have a broad map of which part of the human brain uh, sort of is most involved in controlling different movements. And so if uh, for our clinical trial to restore upper arm movements, we know that we go to the dorsal motor cortex, which is sort of up here. If we want to target the speech areas of motor cortex, we would go from the ventral motor cortex that's here. There are groups that are trying to restore, for example, vision with electrical microstimulation, and we know that the visual cortex is sort of in the back of your head. Or if we're trying to write in a sense of touch or proprioception, we know that that's uh, just behind that motor cortex or on the other side of the central sulcus. And so we kind of have the broad anatomy. And the other fortuitous thing is that it's not like there's little patches, it's not like, a, you know, like there's one tiny spot where all of the information about the arm is or all of the information about the tongue is. And if you don't land your electrode there, you know, you're totally out of luck. It turns out that these signals are really widely distributed and sort of, you can think of it as like, uh, you know, there's a hot spot where you have the most activity, but it rolls off gently. And so the more electrodes you put in, the more information you have about each kind of movement. And that really works to our favor. Last question. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Savisky. Thank you.